What's up you guys? Hey, thanks for watching this video. In this video, I'm going to watch and comment on a TV show, a medical TV show, The Resident. Fortunately for you and I, I was a resident, so we're about to see how good this show really is. Testing can take care of itself right now. Our downtime is finally synced up. That's been a while. Patients are fine, quick page away, which is why I've taken it upon myself to acquire these beauty. In the interest of time, our chief resident, Dr. Benjamin, is at the medical convention and then ready his keys into his office. So I find a locking door. Sure, we're in a locking door. These two are going to the chief resident's office to. This is ballsy, I'll just tell you that. Not that it doesn't happen, I'm just saying it's ballsy. The thing is, is this is not the chief resident's uh, shower because the chief resident, even though it sounds like really cool, you're still a resident and you get this little shitty call room with a little crappy shower and it's usually like a pink tub, you know, like a long, long time ago they were all pink and all that stuff. It's not like nice marble tile and all that. I will tell you, getting a page in the middle of sex is completely realistic and then having to like just leave right in the middle of it. Secret to admire. I was getting jealous. They're for you. But if you being a flower shop, this have asked for me. I've been afraid of my way to a discount. See, he's got this IV in the side of the, his neck there. That is uh, realistic. That's a IJ, so that's the internal jugular vein. So this is a way that we can deliver a lot of fluids and medications, blood products to patients. If they're super sick, uh, a lot of times we give an internal jugular vein IV um, or a large bore catheter, Other, otherwise call it the CVC or central venous catheter because it goes into the central vein, which is a superior vena cava. The other places we put them are the subclavian under the clavicle here on the right or left or in the groin in the ephemeral. Vein. That is fairly realistic. We do put a big whopper uh, IV in there. Let's see, it looks like he's got like a sternotomy um, bandit or something like that. So I don't know what happened to him. This is season two, and uh, I didn't see, watch season one, so we'll find out. I wish I could, but I have a case. Newborn. Sick the size of the this is also very realistic. Anytime something is about to go good romantically in your life as a resident or a doctor, uh, you have a case. Ooh, these little teeny uh, pre preemie babies are like uh, barely a pound. They look like, I don't know. I did pediatric surgery, uh, like a couple rotations, and uh, pediatric surgeons are quite different people. They go for, uh, they train for a really, really long time. And they're very, very busy because there's only a, uh, a, a small amount of pediatric surgeons in the United States. But they're they're pretty interesting people. And uh, one time when I was in the uh, NICU, the, um, the newborn ICU, I was presenting this uh, newborn. And I'm like, you know, this patient is not gonna do well. You know, we have all these problems, blah, blah, blah. The pediatric surgeon looked at me and said, well, it's funner to make a new one. You definitely don't want to tell the parents that. I feel dizzy. Stay calm. Okay, stay calm. Stay cool. Your pulse is ridiculously high. Look at me. When a patient or family member gets a little woozy, you always want to sit them down. Uh, one thing that happens a lot is that uh, sometimes patients want to watch a procedure and you're kind of stuck with basically deciding whether to kick them out or to let them stay. Most of the time, I kind of try to politely move them out of the room because a lot of times those patients, when they see blood or see something happening to you know their family member, they get a little woozy and you always have them sit down. I generally, if they're gonna stay in the room, I make them sit down. Uh, to begin with so they don't fall and have another patient. Dr. Lane Hunter was arraigned on one charge of murder and 12 charges of insurance fraud and money laundering. Dr. Hunter is accused of fraud and murder. She provided false medical information to cancer patients in order to charge them thousands of dollars in unnecessary chemotherapy. So this is actually um, something that happened, I think it was in Michigan somewhere, maybe like Saginaw. Uh, or Grand Rapids. There was a doctor doing um, unnecessary, like I think mole resections and also giving unnecessary chemotherapy to a lot of patients. And they got, I think they got a like life in prison or some crazy thing like that. I don't know the scenario of this uh, lady or who she was last season, but that definitely has happened before. Baby girl's in the OR, my baby boy won't stop crying. <laughs> Labor almost killed my wife, now she's in the ICU, yes. Palpitations. BP's 180 over 120. 
normal protocol would be to send you down to the ER for observation. So uh, a diastolic, the, the low number over 120, is uh, emergent or uh, hypertension. And so that's uh, uh, typically you have to be treated immediately uh, for that. However, I will say that patients that have trauma and also psychological trauma um, can have a transient hypertension or high blood pressure. And it's usually, you know, okay. Uh, this guy's young and healthy. Probably it's, you know, expected in him. He gave us quite a scare. We lost a lot of blood during delivery. How are you feeling? How are my babies? Mabel? As you know, Mabel has hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Prenatal imaging can only tell us so much. So we didn't know the severity of her heart before she was born. Hypoplastic is basically underdeveloped. And so left heart, left heart is the part of the heart that pumps the blood to the entire body. So if that's underdeveloped, then you're not gonna be able to pump blood to the entire body and thus be perfusing the brain with oxygen. Soon after birth, she was taken into surgery, but I assure you that she is in the best possible hands. Okay, this is a fucking huge pet peeve of mine in all of these medical dramas. These guys are scrubbing in right now, okay? So if they're scrubbing their hands, why is their mask not on? Because you can't then put your, you scrub, you're clean, you're supposed to be sterile. You're not actually sterile, but we'll go through that later. But you're not supposed to touch anything with your hands after you scrub. You're supposed to go directly to uh, your assistant. They put your gown and glove on, gloves on and your mask is already on. The other thing that pisses me off is that all these medical dramas have uh, on the, the mask never has any eye protection, and that is a must uh, at this day and age. You have to have eye protection. It's actually mandated in most hospitals. The reason is because you, you know, can have a splash of blood, and you never know what people have. You know, a lot of times you're doing surgery, uh, especially in an emergency setting, you're doing surgery, you don't know if the patient has hepatitis C, hepatitis B, uh, HIV, whatever. So the rule of thumb for all surgeons is to always treat everybody like they have hep C, and HIV, and so you protect yourself, you double glove, you put uh, eye protection on all, at all times. That way, there's never any a question uh, where you do it for some patients and not others, and then you get burned one time, so just always do it. Fever, body aches, the usual. Our mom also had lupus, which led to kidney failure, and then she died, so the usual can be fatal in our family. Okay, so this is something I, I have learned to listen to. When uh, patients say, my family member had X, and she has this, which is similar to somebody else. I always listen to that because I have seen that really turn out to be some crazy shit. I had a really weird presentation for appendicitis. It made absolutely no sense, but the mother said her sister and like her and her aunt both had appendicitis in the same exact way and with the same symptoms. And so I was like, okay, you know, like let's just listen to that and do that, whatever. So I, uh, we went in. We, uh, I said, we'll, you know, go in and see if it's the appendix. If it's not, we're still going to take it out and we would do a surgery for nothing. And the, and the mother was like, absolutely, has to be done. I know it's appendicitis. And so I did it, and sure enough, it was appendicitis. So I always listen to patients when they're. Um, that adamant about it. We'll definitely run your blood work, but if it's anything like your last three admissions, it'll be a UTI, so. So that's the other thing you gotta be careful of is looking at the patient's chart, seeing what they had before, and then automatically assuming it's uh, the same thing as it was before, because then you can really get burned. If the patient keeps coming in for something and it's the same thing, they come in again and again and again, it's like, hello, maybe we're missing something. So you gotta pay, pay attention to that. Oh snap, power's out, now what? The uh, power went out and then it didn't show that the power came back on. So that's a little strange. Usually hospitals have some kind of a backup power system. I've actually had this happen in the OR where the power went out, all the lights went out and then they kicked back on because there's the, the backup system. But uh, sometimes it does happen for five to eight seconds. It, it's a, a delay. And so we had that happen in the, in the of course, like the patient is open on the ventilator. The ventilator doesn't have power. The, then that means that the patient is not getting ventilated and oxygenated and they're not breathing essentially because they're paralyzed under anesthesia. Uh, so it's a little nerve wracking for sure. The uh, emergency power should come back on. There has been situations, actually this is in, I believe Katrina, where it, the emergency power uh, was also depleted 
over a period of time and those patients, then, then you're looking at, you know, what are we going to do with these patients that are on the ventilator, especially, especially in the ICU. There's a lot of different um, things that in the hospital that require power, obviously. And so you kind of have to think of like, what's got power, what doesn't, what can we get away with doing, uh, which patients are gonna be critically affected by this and which patients do we have to move? Because most places there's a lot of hospitals around, but it's, um, you know, sometimes you have to move the patients to another hospital uh, in, out, of the, out of the area where the blackout is, or uh, you have to manually do whatever it is uh, you need to do. And the uh, bypass machines actually have, I believe, a crank. And I, I got called one time when I was in the uh, pediatric unit and they called me and said the uh, ECMO machine, which is like a bypass for the, um, for the ICU, the ECMO machine stopped on a little baby. And I was like, I, I mean, I, I don't know what to do, dude. <laughs> and they called me like, hey, it stopped. I was like, uh, I don't know, call, is there like a tech or something? Because usually, I mean, it's more technical um, uh, problems. And so the, uh, so I of course went there and they were like, yeah, you have to do the, the hand crank on the thing. I was like, oh my God. And like, as soon as, as soon as I was about ready to do the hand crank, like the tech guy showed up and he was like, oh, I'll fix everything. Well, I don't need to like fix it. And I was like, okay. So the headlights are also plugged into the power and they're not batteries. So those should be going off as well. The backup power is on, I don't know, I guess in this situation there's no computers and stuff. You go back to like old school, you don't have the computer charts and it's so much faster and easier to, to, to work like this than it is like with the computers, it's ridiculous. So honestly sometimes it's better when the computer's down. Why did she call him Mr? Oh my God, I would slap that bitch. I recommend thinking before you speak. If that's too much of a challenge, don't speak. As he should say. ...with the city to get it restored as soon as possible. The fire department is on their way to help with emergency power, if needed, treat all current trauma patients and shut it down. ER stays open to capacity, let me know the second that happens. Ortho hits pause, don't cancel a single surgery. Slide them an hour, when we'll back up, start cutting. So you would have to go on divert for trauma patients, uh, and that means like if you have a trauma patient coming in from EMS, uh, emergency medical services, then you'd have to tell them to go to a different hospital. You know, policy dictates that we abandon surgery until full power is restored. Closing now is a death sentence. You don't believe me. Being enabled was simply a sad casualty of unfortunate circumstances. What to do? What to do? Don't be dramatic. You know what you're going to do. Oh, look who put that big girl pants on today. Is there anyone here who is more concerned with their career than saving Mabel's life? Quick show of hands. So this is actually one of the reasons I love being a surgeon. Because, you know, you really have a human to human connection with this person. And you can make a decision, you can say, you know what, I'm gonna do the right thing. And you can live with yourself with, after that. And it doesn't matter what happens like in the eyes of the administrators or, you know, attorneys or anybody. But what you have to do is you just do the right thing for the kid. For the patient. I think that uh, as a surgeon you'll always have a place to go, uh, especially when you make decisions like that. People understand that. Even if that guy gets burned, like the, pe the people in that room will all agree that, you know, he made the right decision despite his um, career, which is really a noble thing to do. We're stuck between floors. I'm claustrophobic. And you got an analogy. Oh, my bathrobophobia is worse. I don't know what that is. It's a fear of stairs and, and, and steep slopes. Sometimes you're like, how do people function in the real world? I'm scared of stairs and uh, elevators. Awesome. Your sister needs an antibiotic to treat a UTI that is quickly becoming a kidney infection. I diagnosed it, so I will treat it if I need to tag in. So it's a little bit uh, of a sticky situation, right? Because there's a lot of nurses that have amazing uh, 
experience and they're very, very good. And then there's some that are not. There's also a lot of doctors that are very, very good and there's some that are not. I've seen this happen a lot where patients are like, oh, I wanna see a doctor or I don't wanna see a nurse practitioner or a PA and this and that. I just will say like, it's all independent. It's like, you can't really judge people based on their, you know, name tag or whatever they have, their, their initials. Uh, just like you can't, or you can, you shouldn't probably judge them on their physical appearance. So. I would have to disagree with that. Obviously, they don't do everything. Maybe bedside matters better, but whatever. Every moment we turn away or transfer patients, we hemorrhage money. Atlanta General and Emory still fully functioning. Storm hasn't affected them. So worst case scenario. It's happening now. Dr. Hawkins, this is a strategy session for department heads only. Half the generators are down in the ICUs. They don't have any backup power. Yeah, a resident would never talk to the, uh, who's his chief medical officer or CEO or whatever he is, ever like that. That would be like, no, it's not gonna happen. And I don't think any CEO, honestly, would ever say we're hemorrhaging money. Some of them are ruthless, but they're not that ruthless, honestly, you know. I'll hold it steady. You start the proximal anastomosis. Did that video assist? Yeah. Proximal anastomosis is, uh, proximal means closest to the heart. So away is distal and um, close is proximal. So it's, this would be like the proximal portion of my arm. This would be like the distal portion of the you know, upper limb, whatever. And then uh, anastomosis is means, uh, osis is, uh, is, a, is an opening or a mouth. So anastomosis is putting two mouths together. So what they're doing is putting two blood vessels ends together. That's an astrophosis. Are you waiting for the world to change or what? Make the call. Typically, like if something happens like this where you think somebody is not being able to take care of what they need to take care of, you just remove them from uh, the case. Not really removing them, but removing them from actually operating and then they just become the assistant. Your professional IT advice is to wait and pay. Goodbye. <laughs> what? <laughs> I fucking love that. <laughs> Goodbye. Sorry, you can't come. Oh. I like a guy that knows how to make a fucking decision, I'll tell you that. So you get a you get a, a 14 gauge needle and you do a needle decompression of the chest, second intercostal space, midclavicular line. You get this big rush of air, you follow it up with a chest tube, and then you save their life. So that's, I think, what they're getting at. We'll see. He's doing a FAST exam. So FAST is a focused abdominal sonography for trauma, so you're looking at uh, different windows in the abdomen and uh, the heart for basically blood. 30 pulses about to go. Give me a thoracotomy, kid. Oh, ED thoracotomy. Why don't you just do a needle decompression of chest tube first, buddy? Because he's an ER doctor. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yes, that's a jab at ER doctors. I love you guys, though. It's the only time you do an ER thoracotomy is when you have a penetrating chest injury and the patient dies. So if they're not dead yet, you probably shouldn't do that. You, you have a couple other maneuvers first. Usually the best uh, survival rate after an ED thoracotomy is when somebody gets stabbed right here. So if they get stabbed, uh, it goes into the, uh, typically the atrium, the right atrium, I believe. And then uh, you can open the chest in the ER and, and uh, sew up the hole before they bleed out. Um, so that's the highest rate of uh, survival with, after an ED thoracotomy. We used to do them for blunt injury, like a motor vehicle accident, and they die in the way to the ER or uh, right in front of you. Uh, but they have such a low, low percent of survival, and uh, it's very dangerous ED thoracotomy because there's lots of sharp instruments around, everything's very bloody, and there's a lot of people around, and usually like people going crazy. And so there's a high incidence of actually other people getting injured. Um, I think he's got a penetrating chest injury though, so that would make it actually reasonable to do if the kid dies. But I would do the chest tube first to make sure that it's just not a tension pneumothorax. Hot shot resident, thinks he knows what he's doing. He's not even in a fucking room. Nothing on his uh, eyes, it's gonna squirt all over. ED thoracotomy, you make a incision from the sternum uh, under the nipple in uh, men and then in the inframemory fold. Uh, for women and then down to the table. You get about the sixth or fifth intercostal space. 
you take a big scissor, you go, uh, you basically cut open the uh, muscle that's in between the ribs, you cut it all the way up to the sternum, and then you open the chest like that. Uh, what you'll see is the lung and then the heart. The heart's got a sac around it. The sac is called the pericardium. There's a nerve that runs right on, this, on both sides of that uh, sac. It's called the vagus nerve. You don't want to injure that. So you go medial to the vagus nerve and you open that sac. And if you're going to save somebody that's typically, if you have a penetrating injury to the heart, you open the sac, a lot of blood comes out because that's called uh, cardiac tamponade. Uh, you relieve the tamponade, which is the, uh, pressure on the heart, and then you sew up the hole in the heart. The other thing you can do is you can, um, if the lung is bleeding real bad, you can twist it around and kind of close the bleeding off uh, by twisting the lung. And then there's one more um, thing you can do, and that's clamp the aorta. And that way, if you clamp the aorta, then that stops the blood flow to the, the um, lower body, and then it allows the blood flow to go to the head and keep the brain perfused with oxygen and save the brain, essentially giving you more time. You're not a surgeon. You don't make a decision too fast. I decide that. That's what I would have said. I love this guy. This is doctor. I decided to say this light by any means necessary. Feel free to help. Oh, by helping, I will just remove you from the fucking room because you don't know what you're doing. So one other thing you can do, you can actually take a Foley, which is uh, something that goes you know, usually in the penis and it has a little balloon on the end. You stick that in the heart and you blow up the balloon and you stop the blood from coming out. It never works really good, but it's in the books. Party people. It's time for you to get in touch with your not so secret. This is my life, party people. I like this guy. We're going OG, baby. And that might be something I would say. We going OG, bitch. We're ready to take off. I need just a second. Okay, smiles on me. People's reactive. We don't go now that it's breaking the weather. We don't get out. So the pupils are equal, reactive to light, what we call, and if they're equal, usually you don't have an increase uh, intracranial pressure. I take that back. You could have an increase in intracranial pressure, which means hemorrhage, but if it's really bad, typically like one pupil is different size than the other. That's a really bad sign, it's kind of, actually kind of a late sign. The other thing you're talking about, he said he made him smile. A lot of times when you have a stroke, there's asymmetry in the smile, so that's why he did that. So now he's thinking it's not, not a stroke. I don't know what he saw on his belly, like a rash or something, I'm not really sure about that. His blood pressure is dropping, he's not having a stroke, he's having an anaphylactic crack. Sure, it really looked like a stroke. They presented with GI symptoms, so I didn't catch it at first, but I'm sure. <laughs> Mangoes. He, it doesn't happen that fast when you get meppy, but it's pretty quick. Think about this, your circulation takes at least a minute for all the blood to circulate one time in your body, so. What were you studying when you dropped out of college? Software engineering at MIT. What's going on? Better question is why I'm not at MIT anymore. Answer, hospital bills so crippling, I had to drop out and she had to declare bankruptcy. Are you faking symptoms to be here? We want less hospital, not more. Why would she fake her symptoms? Because I think she hacked into our system to shut us down. That's crazy, Joplin. This isn't the, the first time that someone's hacked into our computer. The attack started on July 4th. You were here then. Is this true? Did you do this? Oh, this is good! Why are you kidding me? Medical bills ruined us. Chastain ruined us. I can't get the job that I want without the degree from MIT. We are making it work. We are barely getting by. You're working two jobs. Ooh, this is a good drama. For what? This is fucked up. Right. People get destroyed by uh, the cost of medicine. Uh, the number one reason people go bankrupt in, in the United States uh, due to medical bills. Although, I will tell you, if you're watching this, you don't have to do that because most of the time, whoever you owe for, especially for medical bills, uh, will negotiate highly with you and they will knock those prices way, 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 way down. But most people just don't know it. And so they actually uh, will file for bankruptcy before checking into like uh, getting all their bills uh, paid for. So number two, it's messed up that she's all jacked up because of the medical bills. So she then tries to fix her life and her sister's life and then causes all these problems for other people. Now this young girl, only because of healthcare bills, now will maybe go to jail. That is terrible. Chastain shine during a crippling power outage likely caused by bad weather. And a young patient's life isn't completely ruined. That's a win-win. 
nice try, but hacking into a hospital database, cutting off its power, endangering countless lives. I need a name. No, we're not asking for anonymity. We're just asking for leniency. Well, handling this quickly and quietly is in everyone's best interest. He's lying, do not trust him. That improv surgery is the craziest thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, I don't know whether to thank you or to punch you. It's definitely not the craziest thing he's ever done in his life. It was only an E.D. Thor economy, big fucking deal. <laughs> uh, what happened in the elevator stays in the elevator. <laughs> not something I want to advertise. They're definitely going to make out later. No, not these two guys, the other two. My place? I don't know, I'm so tired. I was sleeping like babies before we know it. That sounds amazing. Well, one thing's accurate, how much sex this guy has in residency. That was pretty good. I would say I like that show. Uh, it was uh, a lot of ER stuff, a lot of surgery, which I like. The resident guy is a cocky prick, much like myself I used to be. So I can relate. I like the cardiac surgeon a lot. I like the, uh, whatever he was, the CMO or the CEO, he's decision maker. Um, and doesn't fool around. I, I dig that in people. Yeah, it's pretty good. I think I'll I think I'll watch it again. Anyway, you guys tell me how you guys like it. Uh, let me know in the comments and also let me know which other shows you want me to watch. I actually tried to watch Code Black, but uh, on the CBS website, it's like not there. One other thing I want to say, you guys say that I don't like uh, Dr. Mike, but actually, I don't hate Dr. Mike. I just have to talk shit on him because he's better looking, taller, and younger than me. So the only thing I can do is really just talk shit on him. So that's what I do. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching once again, and I'll see you in the next one.